Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Psych 4100, Cognitive Psychology. Uh, in this lecture, we'll be going over part one of chapter five. Chapter five is on what are known as short-term and working memory. Um, this is actually uh, chapters five and six on memory are my favorite parts of cognitive psychology because uh, one of the things that I study is memory and I find it really interesting. Um, and we're going to really break down the processes of memory, the structures of memory, uh, their implications for uh, your life, for the real world, for, for information. And um, I hope uh, that you all come away uh, as interested in memory as I am, because I think it is a really unique and a really special cognitive ability that humans possess. So without further ado, here are some of the things that we might want to consider or that we'll hope to be able to answer at the end of this chapter five. So for example, why can we remember a telephone number long enough to like place the call, uh, but then we immediately forget it after we've made the call? How is memory involved in the process of, for example, doing math? And do we use the same memory systems to remember things that we have seen and things that we have heard? So to start off, we have to define memory. Memory is the processes involved. Note it's processes, that's plural. So there's gonna be lots of stuff to talk about, and lots of stuff going on. Memory is not just one thing, it is multiple things. The processes involved in retaining retrieving and using information about stimuli, images, events, ideas, and skills, one thing that people don't often uh, consider to be memory, after the original information is no longer present. So uh, to be put maybe a little more succinctly, memory is active at any time that a past experience has an impact on how you think or behave now or in the future. Um, so I'll read that again. And what I want you to notice is how incredibly broad this definition of memory is. Memory is active any time a past experience has any impact on how you think or behave now or in the future. Um, by that definition, I mean, memory is involved in almost all human activity, I would argue. Anytime a past experience has an impact on how you think or behave now or in the future. So what this uh, broad definition should impress upon us is just how critically important memory is to basically every aspect of human functioning. And so what we're gonna do is really break down uh, all the bits and pieces um, so that we can understand just how involved memory is in sort of making you who you are and uh, allowing you to function in the world. So the first thing we need to do is talk about the basic structures of memory. And this is known as the modal model of memory. First, sort of put forth by Atkins, Atkins, Atkinson, sorry about that, and Schifrin in 1968. And they basically proposed three types of memory. Sensory memory, which is this initial holding stage for incoming information, and it only holds information for seconds or fractions of a second. Next is short-term memory, which is where we can hold give or take, and we'll, we'll sort of qualify this as we move through the lecture, five to seven items for about 15 to 20 seconds. So this is when you're, when you're thinking about something, it's in, think of it as living in short-term memory. It is the short-term memory is basically the contents of your current thoughts in, in a sense. It's the things that you're currently holding in mind uh, for about 15 to 20 seconds. And lastly, there's long-term memory, which is this giant storehouse of information um, 
that we can access across your entire lifetime, right? Decades and decades. It's sort of all the stuff that you know. Um, interestingly, this long-term memory structure, uh, we don't really know what its capacity is. Um, I mean, I want you to consider how many things do you know? It's, it's impossible to define how many things you know. Um, I, to, to sort of do an example of this, um, I, every time I teach cognition, I spend about 20 seconds doing just sort of a free association on something that I pick out around the room in, uh, in front of me. Um, and I just start listing all the things I know and let my mind go wherever it goes as sort of an illustration of just how immense and vast our storehouse of long-term memory is. Uh, so right now I'm looking at a, a ceiling fan. Um, so ceiling fans are structures that you put into the um, sort of the, the, uh, the ceiling of your room. Um, they can go in many rooms. Some people have them in dining rooms, uh, but often people have other light fixtures in dining rooms that are more about sort of casting light so that people can eat. Um, eating is a really communal and friendly family experience. Uh, most people to get, get together with their families at major um, sort of cultural or historic or religious holidays. Uh, and food is really thought to bring people together, um, which is one of the reasons why sort of over the last couple of decades, we've seen this, this explosion of food related publications and TV shows and the popularity of things like uh, Anthony Bourdain's show um, on CNN, which was one of my favorite things to watch and, as he traveled around the world. One of my favorite episodes is actually when he came to Atlanta and went to a Waffle House and just absolutely completely fell in love with Waffle House um, as this sort of beacon of incredible, amazing fast food that has this, uh, this sort of deep seated Southern cultural heritage to it. Right, so you see that just in that whatever, uh, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, how many bits of information I thought about and pulled out of memory and incorporated into my free association. I went all the way from a ceiling fan to Waffle House. Right? Um, and so it becomes basically impossible to define the capacity of long-term memory, which I think makes it very, very interesting. Okay, so we can visualize the sort of interactions between these types or structures of memory uh, with this little process diagram or flow diagram. I think we've seen this before probably early on when we just talked about um, flow diagrams. So information comes in, it's stored in sensory memory very briefly, then something like attention gets applied to it and then we start um, seeing things in short-term memory. We can hold things uh, in mind, right? Think of short-term memory as the place where you actively hold information in mind. Now, this only lasts for 15 to 20 seconds, as we said. And so you can reactivate this information through a process called rehearsal. That's where uh, you're trying to remember someone's phone number and you just keep repeating it to yourself over and over, either out loud or in your head. And this rehearsal sort of reactivates the information such that you can keep it in mind for longer than 15 or 20 seconds. And then of course, from short-term memory, we can provide output. Output can be speaking, output can be behavior, output can be thoughts, right? So this is, the result of whatever information we're looking at in short-term memory. And then of course we can move information between short-term and long-term memory such that this information in long-term memory is only activated when something happens to activate it, it's when we want to activate it. So for example, I'm gonna activate a, a piece of information that's currently sitting in your long-term memory but you are not thinking about. I want all of you to imagine what an elephant looks like. And immediately, as soon as I say those words, imagine what an elephant looks like, you can immediately pull an image of an elephant out of long-term memory 
and hold it in mind. You could even manipulate that image. I want you to turn the elephant upside down. I want you to rotate it 360 degrees. I want you to zoom in on its trunk, right? Do all of this sort of quote unquote in your mind's eye. And it's possible because we've taken that piece of information and we've moved it into short-term memory. And then in short-term memory, we can manipulate things. Now also notice that long-term memory can be things like images, right? Pictures, what things look like. And it could also be facts about elephants. You know that elephants are big, right? that there are two major types of elephants. There are African elephants and Asian elephants. Uh, you know that they have big ears, that they eat vegetation, that the males grow long tusks, right? So on and so forth. You can, you can hold all types of information, both auditory, visual, uh, and just sort of data, just information in long-term memory. So we want to think of each of these boxes as like structures of memory or types of memory. And then the arrows represent different processes or control processes that we'll discuss uh, throughout chapters five and six. And so the really learning about memory involves learning about each of these structures and then learning about how these structures interact with one another. So a very basic definition of these control processes are active processes of memory that can be controlled by the person. We've seen one example, which was rehearsal. If I gave you a phone number, you could sit here and repeat it in your head and remember it. Um, but we can also engage in controlled strategies that help make things more memorable. We'll discuss a couple example of those, examples of those as we come up. Uh, through the chapter, but we can actively manipulate information such that it becomes more memorable. Uh, one example is if you relate anything to yourself. Um, so uh, if you want to remember, oh, I don't know, um, a the name of a particular neighborhood um, in the city of Boston, then um, if you can pick out something about that neighborhood that relates to yourself. Maybe that neighborhood is where the best um, Japanese food in Boston can be found. And you love Japanese food. Then you can relate it to yourself and you're more likely to then remember the name of that neighborhood in Boston. And lastly, we can develop strategies of attention that help us focus on certain stimuli. Okay. Uh, two more control processes are known as storage and retrieval. This is basically the movement uh, of information. We'll come down here to this image at the bottom left. The movement of information from short-term memory into long-term memory. So putting it into storage is called storage. And then that information, much like the, the image of an elephant or the facts about elephants, it just hangs out in storage until you need it again. And then when you need it again, you retrieve it from storage. You move it out of storage and you put it back into short-term memory. Now, obviously the process is a lot more complicated than that. There are variables that impact how easy it is to store something. There are variables that impact how easy it is to retrieve something. And then there are variables that impact what we call decay of memory. So just because you put something in storage doesn't mean it's going to be there when you go to retrieve it. Right? Memory is imperfect. It also doesn't mean that it's going to be accurate. You might retrieve a memory and turns out it's wrong. It's actually a false memory or an inaccurate memory. We'll talk about that in, I believe, maybe chapter eight. Chapter eight, if I'm correct, it's, it's a couple chapters away. We'll talk about memory errors. So we have a few major control processes, um, paying attention to certain types of information, rehearsing information, storing information, retrieving information, and then uh, using active strategies to make certain types of information more memorable. 
So uh, let's start with sensory memory. Oh, um, sorry, one quick uh, uh, thing that I should have mentioned. We also call storage encoding, just FYI. You'll see that um, in the book and probably in my, uh, my voiceover as well as um, sort of just out in the world when you, when you discuss memory. Uh, you'll see both the terms storage and encoding used interchangeably. Okay, so uh, let's discuss sensory memory. Sensory memory is for the retention for brief periods of time of the effects of sensory stimulation. What the hell does that mean? Uh, basically, it's a place where the immediate uh, sort of register of sensory information just exists for a quick second and then decays very quickly. Uh, a good example of this is persistence of vision. Uh, so if, if you uh, twirl sparklers around, right, you, you sort of get this effect uh, where your brain is like holding on to that information for just a brief second, right, where, where the light was and you can see it. Uh, this works much like long exposure does in a, in a camera. That's how actually you probably get this image is a camera shutter with a really long exposure. Uh, we get to think about it also as like the frames in a film or something like that. Um, we have two types of sensory memory. Uh, the first is iconic memory. So this is brief sensory memory of things that we see. Um, it's responsible for our example we just saw, the persistence of vision. And then we have echoic memory which is basically the same thing, but for uh, things that we hear. It's sensory memory for sound and the persistence of sound. This is just the place where we tend to keep, uh, or this is the place where we keep sensory information uh, for a very brief and short amount of time. So how do we know that this is how sensory memory works? Well, there is one really uh, perfect ex set of experiments or experiment by Sperling in 1960 that really shows us um, the properties of sensory memory. So we're going to break down uh, this experiment in detail. So what Sperling wanted to do was measure the capacity and the duration of sensory memory. And so he very, very quickly flashed a set of letters up on a screen that looked like this. Now, they were not there for as long as you're seeing them. They were only there for, you know, um, milliseconds, uh, very, very quickly, like a second or less. So you flash these letters up on the screen and then you ask participants in what's called the whole report method, you ask them to report as many of the letters as they can remember seeing. So there are 12 letters here. And if you flash them up really quickly like that, people on average will be able to report four and a half of the 12 letters. So an accuracy, a hit rate of 37.5%. But if you engage in what's known as the partial report method, what this does is it signals participants to report a particular row, either the top row, the middle row, or the bottom row. They did this using auditory tones, so basically a high pitch noise, a sort of an, a medium pitch noise, or a low pitch tone would tell participants, okay, you flash it really quickly. I want you to report the top row, the middle row, or the bottom row, and only that row, only that row. When you do this, participants are able to report on average 3.3 .3 of the four letters, because remember they're only, they're being cued to only report the top or to only report the middle or to only report the bottom. And so when you do it like that, 
then accuracy jumps up to 82%. Because remember, if I'm queued to report the middle, I can ignore the top and I can ignore the bottom and I only focus on the middle. And it's important to note that the queuing happens after uh, the presentation of the letters. So what's interesting about this is that it seems like participants for a very brief amount of time have access to all of the letters, all 12 letters. And then if you tell them which row to report, they can report that row very, very accurately, 82%. But then the information fades very quickly from sensory memory. And we know that the information fades from sensory memory because if we ask people to report all 12 letters, then their performance is very poor, only 37.5% accuracy. And the last um, condition uh, in this experiment was the what's called delayed partial report. So we do the partial report with the tone, except the tone was delayed for a fraction of a second, maybe a half or a quarter second after the letters went away. And so what this delay does, it means the participants don't know which of the rows to, to keep in mind. And so all of the letters fade, then the tone comes. And when they go to report the letters, they've already faded from sensory memory. And so performance is terrible. So here we can see the percentage of letters available to the participant or basically the accuracy. This is partial report. And we can see that as we increase the delay of the tone, performance decreases down to the level of whole report. So basically, if you cue people immediately, right, a zero second delay, and tell them which letters to report, they're very, very good at it. The longer you wait up to a second, the longer you wait to tell people which letters to report, the worse they get, which tells us that sensory memory has a large capacity, but that it decays very quickly. That's your take home message for sensory memory. It has a large capacity, but it decays very quickly. Think about sensory memory as your brain taking a Polaroid snapshot every second. And it saves that Polaroid for, for one second until it takes the next snapshot. And it gets rid of the old polar, Polaroid each time. So it's just going, boom, get rid of it. Boom, get rid of it. Boom, get rid of it. So it's keeping a ton of information for about one second, and then that information decays. The stuff that doesn't decay is information that we have applied attention to and we have shifted and moved into short term and what we will uh, later in this chapter come to call working memory. So sensory memory is our one second Polaroid snapshot where anything that is unattended is quickly lost and anything that is attended is attended to moves into short-term memory or moves into your conscious mind. Short-term memory stores small amounts of information, five-ish to seven, you know, some people are better up to maybe nine pieces of information for a brief amount of time, 15 to 20 seconds. This can include both new information, right, coming, our senses via attention, but it can also include old information coming from long-term memory through retrieval. So I think about short-term memory as a workbench, and I think about long-term memory as a storehouse, a safe. So stuff comes in from your senses. I want you to imagine that you're maybe um, out at a, a restaurant or a bar and your phone dies and you've been talking to this really cute guy and he goes to give you his phone number, but your phone's dead and he walks away. 
so now what you have to do is keep his phone number in mind. Don't call this phone number, please. I don't know whose phone number this is. It, odds are it's not a cute guy. Um, so you have to keep this information actively in mind on your workbench right in front of you. And if you practice it enough, you can shift it to long-term memory. And we call that encoding. And if you did a good enough job, two weeks later, you might even be able to retrieve that information and put it back on your workbench so that you can call him. So let's keep this analogy of a workbench in mind as we're discussing short-term memory. It's the sort of the thing in front of you. It's the thing you're working on. <clears throat> so some of the original experiments on short-term memory wanted to measure the duration of short-term memory. How long does it last? Um, basically, these experiments involve giving someone information so three letters and then a th three digit number and the idea is to remember these three letters so x l p and then you're given a three digit number 285 and you have to count backwards by three from 285 so 285 282 279 276 273, 270, 267, 264. And now, can you remember those three letters that I gave you? XLP. The idea is that XLP are your targets. That's what you're supposed to remember. And they're sitting there in short term memory. The reason that we do this backwards counting, it's actually a distractor task so that the participant can't rehearse the three letters. Because remember, rehearsal is a control process. We're not interested in this experiment in the control process. We're interested in the duration of short-term memory. So by um, making people engage in this backwards counting task, we're interrupting their control process. And so we're measuring pure short-term memory. And so then after some set amount of time of counting backwards, participants are prompted to recall the three letters. And not surprisingly, the longer that you count backwards by three, the worse memory is for the three letters. So after three seconds of counting, 80% uh, correct performance on remembering the letters. After 18 seconds of counting, only 10% correct performance on remembering the three letters. So this reduction in performance is an example of decay, the sort of just passage of time and exposure to competing stimuli cause short-term memory to vanish, to wane. Basically what this shows us is you can't keep something in mind forever, right? Because other stuff starts happening. And when that other stuff starts happening, you start losing the original information. So think of this as, right, Dory uh, from Finding Nemo. You've got about 15 to 20 seconds to keep something in mind. And if you don't rehearse it, it's going to go away. But if you rehearse it, you can sort of start the clock over on this 15 to 20 seconds. And here's their data. This was uh, originally done by Peterson and Peterson in 1959. We can see that it very low retention intervals. So only counting backwards for like three seconds, people are very good. And the longer we make them count backwards, the worse performance. So now we know something about the duration of short term memory. What about the capacity of short term memory? How much information can you remember? The early and most common way to test the capacity of short-term memory was through what's known as digit span. Basically, you just give someone this crazy long string of digits. So uh, I want you to remember as many of these numbers as possible. Six, four, nine, one, seven, eight, two, six, 
nine four three four one zero right like you just give them give people a bunch of random numbers and you see how many of them they can remember the average scores between five and eight um you'll also sort of hear um seven plus or minus two right that's you know somewhere between five to eight to nine items is about normal or average but we can complicate that by asking the question, what is an item? So if the typical result is that people can remember, let's just call it seven items, we can actually get different results by manipulating, and here's where we, we bring back that strategy, uh, that control process strategy of, of remembering things better. If you manipulate what you're, you sort of define as an item, in your brain and in your memory systems, you can actually remember more information. This is known as chunking. These are, uh, sm this is when you take small units of information and you combine them into larger, more meaningful units. The best example of this is area codes. So um, we have quite a few area codes uh, here in the greater Atlanta area. You got 404, you got 678, you got 770. Um, I think there's one more. I'm losing it off the top of my head because it's not my area code. Um, <clears throat> so what an area code becomes is actually not three numbers, right? The area code 404 becomes its own single larger unit of information. 404 becomes one unit of information, not three units of information, not three digits. So you can chunk those small units together using some sort of meaningful strategy and you create meaning out of a larger unit and you're thus better able to remember more information. So also some of the original work on um, the, uh, the capacity of short-term memory was done using change detection. So for example, um, Luck and Vogel would, uh, would display an array of colored squares like this, and you'd have like a, almost a second, so a 900 millisecond gap. And then you'd be shown a second screen, and you'd be asked... Um, did anything change, right, from the first screen to the second screen? Was there a change? In this case, the answer is no, right? We've got the white square up here, the red square there, the blue square there, the green square there, red, black. Oh, there is a change. Look at there. The green and green turned to white. And so you should respond in this case, yes, there was a change. Uh, this holding information in mind, right? What this requires is for you to look at the current screen and then recall this information from short-term memory. And what they found, not surprisingly, is that the more stimuli you add to the set, right? The larger the number of, for example, squares here, then the worse your, uh, your performance. So it's easy to do this when there's only two or three or four squares it's really difficult to do this when there are 12 squares, which tells us something about the capacity of short-term memory. But notice how it's a little larger than our sort of original seven-ish, right? People are, you know, you get this dip around seven, but even out to 12, you know, people are above chance. People are above 50-50. Um, and they added another wrinkle to this experiment by adding uh, conjunctions, meaning that we can do this with lines and the lines can either change color or they can change orientation. Look at this blue line here. It changed, it didn't change color, but it changed orientation. Um, and people are actually pretty good at this. Obviously, the larger your set size, the worse performance uh, over time. So we, we learned that there is a limit, there is a capacity to short-term memory. But notice that this is now a lot of information. Um, this is color orientation, color orientation, color orientation, color orientation, right? It's actually 
it's not four pieces of information. It's eight pieces of information. But what are people doing? They're chunking, right? You're saying a horizontal blue line, a um, angled black line, a vertical red line. You're chunking orientation with color together, and thus it actually helps you improve performance. Uh, two more examples of chunking that I think will help illustrate how they can um, boost memory. Uh, the first is going to be chess, and the second is going to be football. So uh, I'm a bit of a, a chess nerd. Um, I actually read like chess books and study old old uh, chess matches. Um, good fun things. I, I have lots of friends, as you can tell. Um, so if we look at these two panels, these are chess boards with chess pieces. Um, the panel on the right, however, is nonsense. Uh, this is actually an arrangement of pieces that you would never be able to achieve in a in a chess match. Uh, these these pieces have in fact been randomly placed on the board by a computer. These this is just a random computer generated array of chess pieces. It's impossible to achieve this position in in an actual chess match. However, on the left is actually a meaningful position, uh, a meaningful board and position of chess pieces from a real chess match. And when I look at this as I'm not like a chess expert, but like I'm pretty good and I, I spend some time studying chess, I don't see individual pieces. I see patterns. So what I see is up here is a, a king side um, castle from black with a fanchetto of the bishop to the G file and a queen side pawn advance. Now, you don't know what the hell that means if you don't study chess, uh, but to someone who studies chess, this is actually a chunk of information. So the this top right corner of the chessboard is a chunk. That is a meaningful chunk. I do not see this as six pieces. I see this as one chunk of information. Uh, the same thing down here. Um, we have a, uh, a strong central white pawn structure, also with a kingside castle uh, and sort of bishops that are supporting each other. Um, and in fact, this bishop is, is quite memorable um, because it's, this is an incredibly powerful bishop as, it, uh, it, as its domain sort of cuts right through the middle of the board in, in multiple directions. Meaning, if you don't play chess, these two things probably look very similar to you and your memory for them would be very similar. But someone who knows chess can take the information on the left and can use their expertise, their knowledge to form meaningful chunks and they actually can remember more pieces on the left hand than on the right hand board. Now, over to our football example. Um, this is a diagram uh, the of a play. Um, the circles represent the offense. The letters without circles represent the defense. Uh, so you've got two defensive ends, two tackles, a Mike, Sam, and Will, a linebacker, two corners, a free safety, and a strong safety. Uh, that's what these stand for. Uh, here you've got uh, your offensive line. Uh, you've got, this is probably a fullback. This is probably your quarterback. You've got sort of like a, a, a slot receiver. This is probably a running back. And then you've got a receiver out here. Um, and if you don't know anything about football, first of all, you don't probably don't know what those positions are. But secondly, this just looks like an, an absolutely chaotic array of information. Am I right? Like if you don't know anything about football, this is just nonsense and chaos. But if you do know something about football, what you actually see here um, is that this is a weak side counter run play. That's what you would actually call this. Um, and yes, I am both an expert in chess and football. Um, 2004 5A All-State Georgia High School defensive end. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I guess th this is just the slide where I get to brag about myself. Um, but this is actually a, a, what we call a weak side counter. So the, the quarterback is going to get the ball and actually step this way and is going to fake a handoff um, to this running back 
this slot receiver is going to come this way and actually receive the ball. We call it a counter because the ball is going to the left, but all of these um, blockers are blocking to the right, except for this guy on the strong side who's actually pulling and coming through to kick out um, this linebacker. So it's a counter. It looks like the play is going to the right, but then the, the ball actually comes back to the left. So if you have some kind of expertise, you can then chunk information in this way and remember, um, remember larger amounts of information more easily. So if you told a football coach, hey, uh, draw me a counter play, they would give you something that looks roughly like this, right? and it would be very easy and very simple for them to do. Um, however, this doesn't mean that you can't train your memory, right? So if you can use this strategy like chunking, then maybe we can also train ourselves in other ways. Um, Erickson and colleagues in 1980 took a, a single college student, this, this poor, poor, poor college student who had a, basically average memory abilities and they trained them to use chunking before training, the student had a digit span of seven. So like we said, seven plus or minus two, perfectly average. They made this student come into the lab for 230 one hour training sessions to teach this student how to chunk digits into meaningful ways. At the end of it, the student could remember 79 consecutive digits. So they increased their memory capacity from seven to 79. That's pretty remarkable. Now, this was not some genius. This is not some, um, you know, uh, uh, mathematical genius, right, who could remember all these numbers. This is just an average college student who was taught a strategy for rem remembering information. And to sort of complicate things any more, even more, Alvarez and Kavanaugh used a, a, did a similar experiment uh, to the change detection experiment, but they used objects or items that increased in their complexity. So remember, so change detection, we're going to show you a, an array of images and then show you a second array and ask you, did something change from array number one to array number two? So when it's colored squares, Right, people are are good. Right, they're perfect. Um, you know, beyond uh, up to four at least is what they found. Or no, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, let me rephrase that. So they would show an array of colored squares of six different objects. So six colored squares. We do the change detection task, and on average, people get about four and a half correct, right? They can hold about four and a half of them in mind. But if we move, it, instead of using colored squares, if we use these slightly more complex objects like Chinese characters, performance drops. If we use random polygons, performance drops. And if we use these shaded cubes, performance drops. Basically what they're showing here is that yes, the number of items matters, but so does the complexity of those items. So colored squares are very simple. <clears throat> These characters are a little more complex. The random polygons are, are a little more complex and the shaded cubes are the most complex. And so as complexity increases, short-term memory capacity decreases. So short-term memory capacity is governed by the number of items. It's governed by strategy use and it's governed by the complexity of the items. So uh, we're gonna stop here. What I want you to do, this um, video is embedded into the PowerPoint. Um, this is the British memory champion from, uh, I think at this point, probably close to a decade ago is how old this video is. I want you to watch this video, watch his demonstration of his memory abilities, and but also listen to his explanation which is that, I mean, he just worked at it. He just developed strategies, which tells us that you could do this too. 
having a good memory is is um, partially about just having a good memory, right? Some people are better at it than others, but people who actively engage in strategies to improve their memory can do quite incredible things. So um, watch this video and then I will pick, uh, pick it up in part two of this voiceover with the next slide, slide 28, where we will um, sort of shift our focus and take the, the structure that we were calling short-term memory, and we're gonna complicate things a little bit and we're gonna call it working memory. So thanks everybody, watch this video and uh, I will see you next time.